I've been blind since I was born. As I grew up, everything was described to me in such vivid detail. I didn't even realize why it was that important to see, especially having no reference point to compare it. We lived on a single floor ranch house. That's what father told me. In my mind, I could see of course, although unlike how a sighted person could. I had spatial awareness. I knew where my bedroom was, the bathroom, the living room, and the kitchen. Each wall had its own texture. I don't know if that was done on purpose or that I could feel things others never noticed. I rarely fell over. Only a father or one of the visitors put something somewhere they shouldn't. It was usually the visitors, and Dad would shout. They visited infrequently, though not for long. Father said I shouldn't speak to them, that it unsettled him. He'd worry when I saw something he didn't, saw it with my ears or by touch. Ellie was the first. She seemed very sweet. She asked me my name and why my face was so messed up. She was in the living room. I could hear where she sat from her breaths, harsh nasal sounds as if her nose was blocked. When father had a cold, he'd always breathe through his mouth, big, labored breaths, as he wasn't used to it. When people mentioned my face, I always touched it, trying to work out why it was so strange to them. When I asked if I could touch theirs, there was always a pause. I guessed sighted people never did that. Why would they need to? When I asked Ellie if I could touch her face, she reluctantly agreed. But moments later, father entered the room and asked me who I was speaking to. I told him nobody. He would always punish me when I spoke about them. I think it scared him. He'd take my arm and march me off. I'd be knocked off balance and disoriented, to the point where when he finally sat me down, my hands would frantically search my surroundings until I knew where I was. It was usually my bedroom. Every now and then, he'd leave me outside in the middle of nowhere. That was the worst. I would be lost and scared. He told me about the road that ran in front of the house, and the sounds I heard were cars. They'd kill me if they touched me. Those sounds were all I had to know where I was. I waited to hear. Then I knew which way to run back to the house. I heard Ellie that evening. She whispered to me, saying she was scared. I'd whisper back, but she didn't hear. I asked father about Ellie. He didn't want to talk about her. I asked him why. He didn't reply. When I told him that she asked about my face, he asked me what I did. I told him I wanted to touch hers. He laughed, though I knew he wasn't happy. I could hear the difference. When you laugh for pleasure, your mouth is open wide. When you pretend, your mouth is almost closed. To me, the difference is obvious. It wasn't until I was older that he explained. He said we lived in a special place, connected to the other world. That sometimes, dead people slip through. People who died in pain and wanted to reach the living. He explained that because I couldn't see, I was able to tune into that. That they knew I was listening when others weren't. He said I had to ignore it. Otherwise, they latch onto me and never leave me. That all the dead want is to be alive again. It was dangerous. They would trick me. He said he knew how to deal with them, but he couldn't help me if they became attached to me. Alex appeared to me a few years later. She told me she was lost and didn't know where she was. I told her I wasn't allowed to speak to her, but she pleaded for help. I kept quiet, knowing what would happen if I said anything. Did you speak to them? Father asked. Though I was upset, I told him no. I wished I could help her. I knew what it was like to be lost, and it scared me. Alex didn't whisper to me at all. I'd ignored her, and she ignored me. Father saved me. I was thankful. After Alex, I knew what I needed to do, so I did it. They stopped bothering me after that, for a very long time. That was until Sarah appeared. Sarah didn't give me a chance to be quiet. I was on my own, sitting in the living room and listening to the television. Help, she said. I need to find a way out. I stayed silent. You can hear me, can't you? She said, surprised. I'm not allowed to speak to you. I told her. Please, she begged. I'm scared. I'm lost. I want to see my daddy. I gripped the arms of the chair, telling her I wasn't allowed. 
He's dead, she said, and I didn't answer. Your father is dead, she said again. I wasn't going to fall for it. I heard banging from around the room as things began to fly, and the shelves began to shake. Stop it, I shouted, and it did. Please help me leave, she said. I wasn't going to talk to her. I did the only thing I thought would help. I unlocked the front door, hoping she'd run out and get lost just like I would do. When I heard her no more, I locked the door and sat back down. I listened intently for any signs she was still there. Except for the sounds of the TV, it was silent. I hated when my heart raced. I became all too aware of the tick-tock feeling rise and fall within my chest, like it was about to explode. When I heard my father's voice, I screamed. Son, he said, I need your help. I think I'm dying. I did what he told me to do. I didn't speak. If he did die, he'd never leave me. Instead, I raced out into the open air and shouted for help. I shouted until my voice was hoarse. I heard the sounds of cars that raced along the road in front of my house. I shouted until I heard someone respond. It was a woman. What's wrong? They asked. I told them I think my father was dying. They asked what had happened to him. They asked what had happened to my face. I pleaded with them for help, and they promised they would. Sometime later, the woman returned to me. I was sitting on the grass. She asked if she could hold my hand. I'm sorry, she told me. I heard the sounds of sirens and the sounds of people rushing. I asked what was going on. The woman said she was there for me. As the noise died down, a man asked me a question. I'm a paramedic, he said. What happened to your face? I told him I was fine. He asked if I was sure, and I told him I was. He asked if I minded him touching my face. I said it was okay. I screamed and asked what he was doing. He told me everything was going to be okay, and the woman squeezed my hand, saying to be brave. I felt the pressure release from around my forehead, and the air felt cold against my skin. It sounded as if they were peeling an orange. I imagined that in my head, and worried he'd exposed my insides. I didn't know what it was I was expecting. I felt a tight pain within my head, like when you kick your shin against something hard, and then something I've come to understand is bright. It hurt so much. I began to cry. What happened to your eyes? The paramedic asked. I said I was blind. He asked to check them. The pain returned when he examined them. Do you know him? He asked. The woman told me I was screaming for help and she came. She didn't know me. How long have you had the eye injury? He asked. I told him I was blind from birth. He asked me if I could see his fingers. I told him no. He asked if I could open my eyes. I said I didn't know what he meant. He asked if he could open them. I didn't respond. I felt his fingers on my face. Fingers covered in something rubbery. Then the brightness again. I screamed. He tried to calm me. The woman squeezed my hand again. I didn't know what was going on. Things I couldn't describe came to me. It was like it always was, but a hundredfold, so much more real. I carried on screaming as a fuzzy form came into view. Just breathe, okay? Everything will be fine. When was the last time you saw? The paramedic asked. As my heart began to calm and my breathing slowed, I was distracted by what I was experiencing. It overwhelmed me. I wanted to cry, and I did. How long has it been? He asked again. I've never seen anything before, I told him. I was told to keep the eye mask on for most of the day, only taking it off at night at first to allow my eyes to adjust. I had been staying with my uncle and aunt I didn't even know I had. They were shocked at what happened to me and that I hadn't been to school. It's been a roller coaster ride. The doctor said I may never get perfect vision, though I will take what little vision I have. It's a godsend. I've been learning to read and write the past few years. Sorry if my English isn't brilliant. It's the best I can do. I've been asking my aunt what happened to my father, but all she says is he died of a heart attack. I asked what type of man he was. She says he was her brother and she'll love him no matter what. My uncle doesn't want to talk about him at all.
I've been using the computer a lot recently and really enjoying the internet. I can't believe there is such a thing. After being so lonely for so long, I can talk to whoever I want, when I want, though I'm wary of that. How do I know if who I'm speaking to is alive? No one seems to worry about that, like father did. Someone asked me today who I was. I was on a forum talking about the spirit world. I was so happy to find people who I could relate to. They sent me a link. They asked if I was the same person. It was an article on a true crime website. It was about my dad. They mentioned to me by name. That I was bound so I couldn't see. That my mother had gone missing soon after my birth. That my father always wanted a daughter. They found 14 bodies in the basement. They said one got away. A girl by the name Sarah Frank. She was the one to call the police. They supposed he parked the car around the back of the house. That's where they found it. He carried them into the basement via the storm entrance, where he'd leave them. Sarah had managed to get away after she agreed to be his daughter following four days of sustained torture. She then stabbed him with a kitchen knife he'd placed on the counter to butter some toast. I didn't want to believe it. And I'm not sure I would have, if it weren't for the names of the victims. Two stuck out. Ellie Farmer, Alex Riddle but I'd spoken to them in the living room. To this day, I wonder if my father was honest with me about one thing in his life. Did I speak to them before or after he killed them? Today marks 18 years since my wife and I lost our daughter. She was born when we were both in our teens, so at times it really feels like a lifetime since we last saw her. Her name was Susan, and she was only four when we lost her. She was the absolute center of my wife's world. Understandably, the loss was unbearable for her. We've both dealt with lifetime friends passing before, but I had never seen her as devastated as she was after we lost Susan. The police searched for months, I suspect longer than they normally would have, for a case like this, given the hell that my wife put them through when they had no new leads to report. Eventually, they stopped actively searching for Susan, and, in one way or another, told us that she could still be alive out there, but to start to cope with the fact that we'll probably be living our lives without her. After using up all the time she was allotted away from work, Sarah, my wife, eventually lost her job. She spent her time holed up in the room we kept Susan's crib in, sometimes clutching some of her old toys. Her favorite had always been this little red fire truck that would flash when a button on the back was pressed. The batteries have since died, so I'm not sure if it works anymore. I always felt a little guilty for the sense of apathy I felt towards it all. Maybe it's just the way that I cope. Maybe just a personality trait. Who knows? Every time the new year comes around, Sarah seems to fall into a minor bout of depression, considering the news she received on that day years ago. For most, the 1st of January is a reminder that the new year is something to look forward to, a time to learn from the mistakes of the previous year, and a time to start fresh where it's needed. For Sarah, the occasion of the holiday seems to just bring the terrible memory back all the more intensely. This year was a bit different, to say the least. My head is still spinning while I try and wrap my mind around everything. I really needed to tell someone what happened, in order to work through it, and I couldn't share it with my wife, so here I am. The day started like any other January 1st, my wife sullenly stumbling into Susan's old room while I start preparing the best breakfast I know how to make, to try and do anything to cheer her up. The first strange event of the day occurred when I went to check the mail and found a single envelope in our mailbox. We don't get mail today, sweetie. Close the door, it's freezing, I heard coming from inside. You know that I always forget that. That's what you get for marrying an idiot. Must have missed something from yesterday. Just leave it on the table or something. Only thing we get in the mail that I care about is bills, and I sure as hell don't feel like dealing with that today. I threw the envelope on our little round kitchen table, and my wife went upstairs to get a shower. 
I poured some coffee for myself, and, after setting it down on the coffee table, I slumped down into our couch and went about my morning tradition of finding a TV channel that wasn't playing something completely insipid. It took all of five minutes of scrolling through the seemingly endless directory of channels before I felt compelled to check the envelope. Although we're not scraping by by any means, I've always been pretty paranoid about money, and if it was a bill, I needed to know how much money we'd be coughing up. I think the paranoia may come from the financial hell that followed my wife losing her job after we lost Susan. I grabbed the envelope and paused before instinctively ripping it open. Our address, or a return address, were nowhere to be found on the envelope. It was completely blank except for the words, To you, written sloppily on the front in the center. I resumed opening the envelope, now more out of curiosity and less out of financial concern. I'm hoping my wife didn't hear the gasp I let out reading the contents of that letter. A notebook paper that looked decades old was written. Happy death day to me. Happy death day to me. Happy death day, dear Sudson. Happy death day to me. After sitting stunned for several minutes and a bit weirded out that I had read the letter in my mind with the familiar tune that was supposed to evoke happiness, I quickly ripped the letter into several pieces and rushed it into our trash can outside by the curb. I heard Sarah turn off the shower and there was no way in hell I was going to let her see it. I had trouble fathoming how cruel someone would have to be to play this kind of a joke on a family that lost their child. And who the hell would even be able to? Only very immediate family and a couple close friends know that we lost Susan. And how would they know that I used to call her Sudson when I'd give her a bath because she loved playing with the soap bubbles? Only her and maybe Sarah knew about that dumb nickname. A few minutes later, Sarah descended the stairs and joined in my pursuit to find a TV channel worth watching. We always joked about how it was time to get rid of cable, but never seemed to find the initiative to follow through with our plan. We sat in silence once we landed on a channel playing some crime show. Sarah loves those. All that was swimming through my head was that letter and about a million other questions. As the day progressed, the letter worried me less and less. Sarah and I planned a wonderful dinner that we were going to prepare together. We picked out a movie to watch, and I had grabbed a gift for her at the local jewelry store to give to her after. I wanted to make the day special for her, and she really didn't seem as despondent as previous years. I think she was finally beginning to come to peace with what had happened. Better late than never, I guess. Midway through preparing our meal, the phone that we kept on our kitchen counter began to ring. I asked Sarah to answer it while I continued working on breading the chicken that we were making. Okay, but try not to ruin the meal. Very funny. Hello? The phone was just loud enough for me to make out what my wife was hearing. The last song in the world I wanted to be reminded of. Must be the wrong number. It's neither of our birthdays today. Unless you've been lying about yours the whole time, she said hanging up the phone. I tried my best to force a laugh. The meal was a success and Sarah loved her gift. Our movie ran pretty late, and we had finished the entire bottle of whatever wine Sarah had picked up on her way home from work yesterday. We decided to head to bed early, because we both need to be up pretty early for work tomorrow. Sarah made her way up the stairs, and I worked my way around the house, making sure that our doors were locked and any lights were turned off. As I went to turn off the light over our kitchen sink, I glanced through the window and something caught my eye in our backyard. We have giant shrubs near the back of our property. They had lost all their leaves because of the season, and I saw through just enough to realize that there was something behind them. Being the paranoid guy that I am, I knew I had to investigate before my brain would let me go to sleep. I threw on the closest pair of shoes that I could find and grabbed my phone to use as a flashlight. As I got closer to the shrubs, a pang of nervousness shot through my body. I momentarily thought of turning back, but convinced myself otherwise. I forced one foot in front of the other, until I reached the shrubs. 
Behind them, I found a little red fire truck with a bundle of about five balloons floating above it, tied to the center of the toy. Plastered on one of the balloons was a note. I struggled to force myself to get any closer to the toy. When I bent down and grabbed the note, it read, Did you get my letter? I've started to like it down here. It was written in that same familiar sloppy handwriting that I recognized from earlier. I was nearly knocked over with either guilt or terror or nervousness or all three. I was back inside before my brain caught up to what my legs were doing, and now here I am. I guess I can't find closure if I'm not honest. Where else to be honest but here? I had to do it. The constant crying and whining was too much. We were spending so much money on toys, clothes, pre-K schooling, and whatever the hell else. My wife spent all day obsessed with the thing. I couldn't take it. It was a strain on our relationship and a damn mistake. A mistake I tried to fix. Apparently after what's happened today, one I failed to fix. But I had to try. Judge me in whatever way you wish. I'm my own harshest critic. Most of the time, anyway. I had to do it. Hell, it's taking her a while to get over it, but I think even Sarah would eventually come to thank me if she knew. Thank you for making it this far. I am so happy that you made it to the end of the video. So, if you liked it, give it a like. Let YouTube know that it was worth listening to. And if you really like me and really enjoy my content, consider subscribing. I don't ask for much, but just consider it. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter at S underscore A underscore Midnight. If you would like to follow me on Instagram and visually see the shenanigans I get up to, Stories After Midnight is the handle. More of a podcast fan, I have the Midnight Podcast. You can find that anywhere you find a podcast. And lastly... If you would like to give your hand at writing, send me a story. Head on over to storiesaftermidnight.reddix.app. You can find the link in my Twitter bio and you can send me a story. I will take a look at it if it's written well and I will consider reading it. So thank you for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. Take care.